Yay Networks. Welcome to the Great Girlfriends Podcast, where we discuss life, love, laughter, and everything in between. I'm your host, Sibla Muti, and I can't wait for you to hear all of the Great Girlfriend magic on today's show. So without further ado, grab something great to drink, grab your pen and your paper, and get ready for this week's episode. Enjoy! Happy Wednesday, great girlfriends, and happy summer. What a, an amazing kickoff to summertime. It's been wonderful for me. My kids are finally out of school, which is good, bad, I guess you could say, because you got a summer camp schedule. You got, uh, I don't know. Maybe I like it, maybe I don't. But anyway, <laughs> I'm super happy to just be in this season of summer and this the freshness and the spirit that it holds. And I'm also super excited because my virtual great girlfriend in my head from like six years ago is actually on the show right now. And if you know anything about therapy for Black girls, you're going to be super excited to know that I am speaking with Dr. Joy Harden Bradford today. Hey, Dr. Joy. Hey, Sybil. How are you? I am so good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Okay. So you didn't know that you're my great girlfriend in my head, but you are. (laughs) I, I approve. I approve. I you that. are. You've been in the podcast space, you know, as long as I have. Um, you have touched on everything around mental health, the things that we need to talk about that we don't want to talk about. But we, when we do talk about, we're glad we talked about. Um, so you give us so much value in conversation. And I, I just sit at the foot of your show and I love your spirit and I love everything that you've been doing. And I, listen, when the podcast fatigue sets in and I see you posting on Wednesday, I'm like, yep, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> just keep going. Just keep going. Keep going, yeah. right? Because does, doesn't it get, can get tiring? Yes, yes. It, it's, a, it's a lot of work. I think when you listen to podcasts and it sounds so effortless, like people are just talking, but you don't realize until you're on the other side how much work it may, it takes to make it sound effortless. Exactly. And yeah. I mean, and to have uh, longevity, in this space is because you are passionate about the women that you serve, the community that you serve and the message that you're delivering. I know, you know, there's some weeks where I'm sitting here like, what am I going to talk about? And then I have to refer to the why, like what the need is and what needs to be reinforced. And you have been so consistent in your reinforcement around our need to, to honor the healing spaces that lie within ourselves. And that Mm -hmm. is so important to, Right. Isn't that savory? Yes. That's it real is. savory. <laughs> but that is, that's what you have been so consistent in, in um, reinforcing for us. And I think we hit a space post pandemic where we realized, wait a minute, we need that message more now than ever, because um, some things that we didn't know would surface in our beings surfaced and some feelings and some thoughts about our lifestyle or who we are as women and even our relationships evolved. Um, I know you know much more about that than I do because you're 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 in the hours in the trenches of conversations with people, all types of people. What have you what have you been seeing? Yeah, you know, I think that everybody has had such a different reaction to the experience of the pandemic, and I think largely people have had grief reactions that they didn't recognize Mm. as grief, right? So we have, you know, a lot of us have lost loved ones as a part of the pandemic, but there's also just the loss of life as we knew it, the loss of a sense of security, the falling of government structures, um, you know, loss of important events and vacations and things that people have been looking forward to. And so I think there has been a lot of grieving that people have not known what to do with because Mm -hmm. I don't think they actually knew that they were actually experiencing grief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's something. And there's so many places where uh, we found certainty and we didn't even know that we were leaning into them until the foundation cracked, right? It's like, You didn't know how much you relied on the stability of our government structure until the insurgents, right? And you're like, the insurrection, you're like, what in the world is going on up in here? And so, um, and just the rotation of who we are and what we're doing, like being able to see ourselves in motion. That's There's a sense of certainty that comes from that. So I do, I recognize that uh, more than anything, that season of grief, um, it felt like it just wouldn't end. And like you said, Grief comes in so many forms and we don't even recognize it because we look at grief oftentimes as the death of a person, um, but the death of maybe a routine or even, um, you know, a community, those things. I'm sure that that has shown up in a lot of the conversations that you've been having. 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Those kind of like chance encounters you would have with people, you know, who worked at your favorite restaurants or that you would see, you know, in the commute. All of those kinds of things really were disruptive for a very long time. And so I think people are really just trying to rebuild, like, what does community even mean? And yeah. how can I lean into it more significantly? And what does it look like to even rebuild it for myself? Mm. Well, I love that. Um, what your new baby Congratulations on your new baby. I know you have two sons, but you got a third baby. And so, uh, (laughs) and it's not a traditional baby, great girlfriends. This is a baby. This is her new book, Sisterhood Heals. Um, I love so much the title of the book and the intention behind the book. And, um, you know, because what people do ask when they're going through these, these seasons of grief is how do I get out? Will I ever, right? Like, is this ever gonna end? But then how? And there's so many healing spaces that you find in the center of sisterhood. And when I saw the title of your book, I just, I was leaping for joy, pun intended, because you are the perfect person to really author and celebrate the power of healing in sisterhood. So give me the birthing space, your home or where were you, Starbucks or (laughs) with your girls and you're like, we need to talk about this. You know, so I feel like the birthing space really was with my agent. Um, ah. So I, I have known for a while that I would write a book eventually, right? Mm-hmm. But it, but I couldn't figure out like what it would be. And so in a conversation with her, she said, you know, there may be many books that you write, but what would this first one be? Like if you had to plant a flag in the ground about who Dr. Joy is, who mm-hmm. Therapy for Black Girls is, what would it be? And it immediately came to me that it was sisterhood. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. How important is that message? Tell me for you, how do you define sisterhood? What do you how do you view that that word when you see yeah, it? Yeah, so I feel like the the word that comes to mind most immediately for me is life saving. Because I think mm. that that is often who we are and what we are to one another. And so the book really is a celebration of the life saving relationships that we have with one another and mm-hmm. a guide to how we can have those relationships be more fulfilling and stronger. Absolutely. We might turn this in the church because, you know, (laughs) I know firsthand the power and importance and the Great Girlfriends brand was birthed out of the need to celebrate these supercharged relationships where you can have a launch space and a landing pad, like uh, that that oasis of sisterhood. And so and and, and even so, in my own struggles um, overcoming depression, it was my sisterhood, my sisters, my great girlfriends that that double as sisters. Those were the people that helped me heal and know that healing was was uh, essential. And so I understand and and can wholeheartedly relate to that. Um, in 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 terms of where we are as women in culture, I feel that we understand. Um, our calling to be better and and to be more kind, more loving, more generous, more connective um, to one another. I think that we have evolved in terms of there. There was narratives once upon a time that we, as specifically as Black women, you know, we're always tearing each other down and uh, you know, is uh, you know destroying our our name and our image in some of the media that we've seen. And for what you've done with therapy for Black girls is you've helped us remind you've helped remind us that healing is popular, healing is sexy, it's essential. And now I think in the sisterhood space, we even see more people wanting to amplify the good, right? Mm -hmm. And kind of kill that negativity that was tied to, I guess, the reality TV um, uh, era where reality TV was prevailing and those narratives were prevailing. Tell me how you've seen um, in your community some of the ways that sisterhood has created healing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are so many ways. I mean, you just gave us a beautiful personal example. You know, how many times when we are struggling with something, it is our sisters who get that call first, right? Or they are even the ones who recognize like something's off here, like what's going on? And so they kind of gently call us in around um, what's going on and how can I help you take better care of yourself? Mm -hmm. And to your point around this like competition and like Black women don't get along with one another, there's a chapter in the book called sisters over systems um, Mm. that really speaks to this idea that there are a lot of systems invested in us not being who we are to one another, right? Like we know the power that Black women often have when we are on the same accord and like really operating as a collective. But when we think about the systems of patriarchy and sexism and this idea that there can only be one star Black girl in the office, right? Like there's a lot that works against us. And so that chapter is really about 
all these systems that are in play to kind of keep us from engaging in sisterhood and how we can remind each other that it is really the systems we are fighting against, not each other. And to pull mm-hmm. ourselves out of these, you know, like feeling like there can only be one or that I have to close the door behind me because you might be a threat to my spot. Um, yeah. So I really feel like, you know, when we are able to engage in that kind of space, there's really no limit to what we can't do and who we can't be. But there are a lot of systems that are working against us in that, in that effect. I couldn't agree more. I think it's um, so interesting how many brands and products and, you know, how much media will sensationalize the negativity, right? And so when you start talking about systems, there's data that shows, like, you know, how much more valuable it is to certain brands that we look bad and we look good. And you know what I mean? I love that you are speaking to the systemic nature um, that has, you know, really come to disrupt our sister. I mean, our sisterhood really has been freedom, literally. <laughs> yes, yes. There's a long history. You got I mean, a the history. book kind of starts there with uh-huh. the history. Like, we don't get to where we are here talking on a podcast with one another without the long legacy of Black women doing this work before us. Yeah. Um, so there's a history in us really kind of being sisters to one another. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I love that. I want to touch on isolation a bit because, um, you know, when you're going through dark times and when you start to feel your lows, I think our, our first inclination is to isolate. Um, and to, and, and in isolation, you know, the devil comes to kill, still and destroy. He's like, yep, I got you in the darkness. Let me make it real dark. Um, yeah. and so I think that is like a spiritual tactic of the enemy to really, really do the best, the best parts of destruction. Like he can destroy us the best when we're alone. Um, and what I'm hearing you say is the light and the healing and the wholeness comes from us coming together. What are some of the things that you kind of teach women when they are, when they are in need of healing in terms of leaving that, you know, isolation, uh, stepping away from isolation and walking into light or walking into connection. Mm -hmm. So I think that that really starts with understanding that you have to kind of uh, turn away from that negative self-talk that is often happening as a part of depression or when we find ourselves in very low spaces, because our self-talk at that time will tell us I'm a burden nobody cares. I'm too much for other people. But if you can really slow that down and say, you know what, that's not true. I know that there are lots of people in my life who love me and just send out the SOS signal. We know that sisters will generally swoop in, right? And so it really is about acknowledging when you're in a difficult space and understanding that there are people there that can help you to carry the loads, Mm -hmm. really helping you to Um, release some of the shame because sometimes what happens is that, you know, something has happened or we made a mistake or whatever, and we can't get out of that trap of feeling like this is such a shameful thing that I've done or that's happened to me. But if we can actually see that we can share this in spaces that feel safe in in spaces that we can be vulnerable, then we know that there are people there that can help us. But it really is a lot of like getting out of those cognitive distortions that tell you that you're not good enough. You're not you're a burden to other people that nobody will be there to help you. Yeah, that's so good. You know, I think it's um, that negative self-talk. It, it is the destructive, right? It is yeah. the one, it is the thing that kills all the beautiful thoughts that are happening. It's like, the, it's like they come in like a, a, a fighter jet. They're like, no, you can't. Yes. Boom. You know, no, you won't. <laughs> and, yeah. and honestly, that war is happening um, at such a high pace, a high frequency in most of our minds. And you have to come to a point where you decide that, you're going to win. You know, I think you have to come to a point where you realize that it's it's just sabotaging. Like those thoughts are just, they're presented as tactics to really destroy that birthright of winning. And mm-hmm. when we can open up to that, there are people who really are waiting. I have, have been in so many times where my, my, uh, my, my, my low self said, go isolate, grab the ice cream, pick yeah. a good show, let's go binge, right? And, and just go wallow and wallow and step away. And then my, my highest best self said, girl, phone a friend, <laughs> mm-hmm. yes. you know, phone, phone a friend, tap in, don't tap out, like tap in. You, you have been blessed with people who love you good and bad and ugly. Right. And they're waiting mm-hmm. to be there to catch you. So like tap yes. in. Yeah. i love that mm-hmm. so much. So, okay. When you think about the impact of, of, um, that healing and sisterhood, what do you envision happens after we learn and adapt um, that that way of thinking and approaching sisterhood? 
Mm -hmm. I think then we are able to have some of the difficult conversations that we need to, because I think that there is a lot of, I, I, I don't always think we think about like friendship in relationships with our sisters in the same ways that we do romantic relationships, right? So there are all these right. books and all these things around like how to have great conversations with your partner, but can we also do those things with our girlfriends? I think sometimes oh, we think friendship oh. should just be easy, <laughs> but it is also another relationship that we have to maintain and be intentional about, yes. right? And so seeing some of those difficult things, like, you know, I'm really jealous that you got that promotion and I didn't, right? Or that oh, you got goodness. engaged yeah. first and I've, you know, kind of been waiting for that. Being able to create a space where we can have conversations like that that people often want to avoid because they feel like it means the relationship will end yeah. when truthfully having those difficult and awkward sometimes conversations most often brings a relationship closer. For sure. For sure. That is so powerful. I um, just recently did an interview with two women who have been friends for 54 years. Wow. wow. Right. 54. Yes. And they came in for this interview and they were just as connected and bubbly and happy and lighthearted. They've been friends since they were four. And um, and they talked about that, that, um, you know, that there is there there should not be when you do find that, you know, it's a tinge of jealousy in a friendship or you feel like you have been competing, that it's more of a place of self-awareness and reflection versus the friend causing you to feel this. It's more of, you know, it's, it's not something that you run from, but you stop and self-reflect. Right. What is it that I need to fix instead of, you know, canceling out the friendship because maybe there was a bit of jealousy because those are real feelings and humans are in these relationships. And so you're going to get human feelings <laughs> in, in friendship. Um, and we don't get to choose which, you know, which characteristics or which emotions are going to show up in our friendship. But mm -hmm. we do get to decide how we respond and how we engage with them and how we help our sisters when those type of emotions or those type of feelings come up. Yes. Yeah. And you bring up a really good point because it's not just the friend who may be experiencing some jealousy, but it's also on you as the person who they may be jealous of to be yeah. able to hear it. Right. Yeah. And not immediately get defensive and like, oh, my God, she doesn't want the best for me and that kind of thing. Like yeah. you said, they are very natural emotions, just like happiness and sadness. Jealousy yeah. is something that we do experience. And so can I talk with you about it? Like, is there enough safety in our relationship for me to say this thing and for us to move through it together as opposed to it, you know, breaking us up. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. And I have to tell you, Dr. Joy, that's been coming up quite a bit. Yes. <laughs> so it has been coming up quite a bit. And I do think um, part of that could be because of how much flexing is happening on social media, how many people are leaned up on luxurious vacations, on luxury cars, uh, you know, how many people are saying they got their business to six figures overnight? Um, I do feel like that's a bit of what makes um, or what introduces the idea of jealousy and competition a little faster in friendships than it would have before. I don't know for sure. I have no data. None. Mm -hmm. It's just, just <laughs> simple saying I believe in my in my auntie mind right. that that's part of the contribution. Um, and I think we have to take ownership of the idea that sometimes those things can make you feel inferior if it if it makes you feel you know, or sometimes those things make you feel behind or make you feel like you are um, chasing something that someone else has versus pursuing, you know, your own potential. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you. I also have no concrete evidence, but I think yeah. just, you know, in listening to people, like listening to women, you know that this comes up, right? Like you yeah. even know, like even for myself, like I will see certain things on social media and like, oh, like I wish I had that or, you know, like that kind of thing. I think, yeah. again, that is just natural and human, but yeah. it is important for us to pay attention to like what is coming for us coming up for us when we follow or engage with certain accounts and, and to really do some auditing around yeah. your social media spaces so that you're not constantly in this comparison zone, but really following accounts and engaging with accounts that make you feel like your life is good enough because it is good yeah. enough. There may be other things that you want to have and other things that you want to do, but it doesn't have to be a better than kind of a situation. It may just be a not right now. You know, I love that. I love your life yeah. is good enough. It really is yeah. like that. That spirit of contentment is is mm. very important. Do you have a favorite chapter of the book? 
You have a chapter ooh. that you like, ooh, I liked writing this. <laughs> <laughs> so I think my favorite chapter is the one about how difficult conversations can often lead to intimacy mm -hmm. because in doing research for the book, I found that there were three main things that came up where tension typically occurs in sister circles. So that is when somebody gets engaged or married, when somebody has a baby or brings a baby into the family and when there mm -hmm. is some kind of promotion or career success. There That's can life. Be tension. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we can't even live. No. Like <laughs> we, can't, we can't even live. Yeah, but that but that is often an area of tension that I have wow. seen that like sister circles don't necessarily navigate well. Yeah. And so I wanted to dedicate an entire chapter to like providing scripts for things that you can say when you notice those feelings of like, oh, that that kind of feels prickly that, mm -hmm. you know, she got engaged first, right? Like, how do you open up these conversations? And how do you as the receiver actually listen to when your girlfriend comes to you with this kind of a concern? Yeah. I'm going to have a full moment of transparency. I shared this in the Great Girlfriends Facebook group about uh, the question came up about um, prickly, that word you use, prickly, which is so good mm -hmm. around conversations that um, are difficult to have. And my father passed in 2020 due to Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. And after he passed, you know, people tell you about the stages of grief and you're like, I don't know what stage I'm in right now. Maybe I am in, you know, anger. I'm not qu quite sure. But I had a stage of jealousy where mm -hmm. that first Father's Day was approaching. And I had some friends that were like, you know what I'm going to do for my dad? Look at me how petty I'm being right now. I'm going to do for my dad and boom, boom, boom. Right. <laughs> and so, and mm -hmm. I wanted to, I was like, why do they get another father's day with their dads? And I don't like, I, I didn't feel, and I, and I told them, I was like, I got to work through this. This is not you. It's me. I want to be so happy mm -hmm. that you, but I, I didn't even, I never thought I would experience jealousy like that. Cause I just love mm -hmm. my friends so deep and all the things, but I was like, why do they get an, I feel like I called it an extra father. Why did they get an extra Father's Day? Mm -hmm. Like, why couldn't yeah. I get an extra Father's Day? And I mm -hmm. had to work through that because I realized if I permit that jealousy to dwell, then it just, just start to spread into other parts. And, and another thing, how did she get that promotion? Or how did she, you know, while I'm at right. it, being jealous. And that 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 uh, prickly emotion would amplify. And when I tell you my friends were so loving, they were like, we get it. Our dad is mm -hmm. your dad. And you know, what would you wow. want to do? You can still do whatever you wanted to do for your dad. And you, you know, like they, they were so loving and they just, they understood because yes. yeah, instead. And so I was so, I was so nervous to even tell them like, I'm feeling jealous, mm -hmm. but I knew that they loved me enough that they would help me work through it because yeah. I don't want to be the friend that hides when it, when things are ugly in my life. I want to be the friend that is like, here I am, girl, like get all of this good and bad. Just right. <laughs> so right. I just wanted to share that because like you said, um, it is a real life example of, the, of that chapter and, and navigating difficult conversations. And mm -hmm. also you, you don't know, you, you don't know when, and it, when you're going to get hit with a feeling that is foreign to you in typical scenarios, but when right. it does happen, right? Like those three, um, especially, you know, marriage and engagement, um, come, it comes up so frequently in the great girlfriend community that, you know, they had a hard time cheering for that girlfriend, right? Yeah. It's like, I'm happy for her, but I really want my own. Right. And yeah. And so, um, I'm excited for everyone to jump into this book. I'm not going to hold you because I know <laughs> I could, but I am excited about that chapter helping them to walk into a new chapter in their lives in terms of healing and understanding that it's okay and how to introduce those conversations, right? Mm -hmm. And it's so important, just like you shared, like you were able to have a good outcome, right? Yeah. You shared this thing that could have been a little bit scary and your circle was able to hold you. And yeah. I think we do not often give our circles enough credit for how they can hold some of these more prickly conversations. Yeah. All right. We need to get into our prickly conversations, but we also need to get into this book. So tell everyone where they can find the new book, Sisterhood Heals, which is going to be their new favorite bedside book. It's going to travel on all the trips. It's going to be in all the clubs. So let's talk about it. When, where mm -hmm. can they find it? You can find it at sisterhoodheals.com and in everywhere else that you find books. So Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Target, all of the places. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And we always, um, when we introduce authors, do a book giveaway. So for the first five people that email, we're giving away 
copies of Sisterhood Hills to you. You got to be one of the first five to email us about this episode of the podcast. And we're going to do a personal giveaway as a way to celebrate you, Dr. Joy, and honor the book and warm up the market around it. We just want to let you know that we are here cheering you forward in this uh, book launch. And we're happy to have had you on today. Oh, thank you so much, Sybil. I really appreciate it. It's uh, Listen, I told you, you've been in my head. Now now we real, my kinana, we real, we real friends. <laughs> we real friends. <laughs> thank you for being on today. I appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks. Hey, great girlfriends. It's me, Dylan, and this is the Motivational Minute. So the quote for today is, if you prioritize yourself, you will save yourself by Gabrielle Union. And so that quote really talks about taking the self-care that you need and giving you the things that you do need to help you feel better and keep yourself from doing all bad decisions. And I really feel like this talks about women today because a lot of things are going on in the earth, especially the woman. And so it helps us keep our self-care going and keep us going throughout the day. This has been your Motivational Minute and I'm Dylan. Bye. All right, great girlfriends. Did you enjoy this week's episode of the podcast? If so, would you please give us your amazing review on iTunes? Every single review helps another great girlfriend get plugged into the podcast and the community. Speaking of community, make sure you join our Facebook group at The Great Girlfriends. Follow us on Instagram at The Great Girlfriends and on Twitter at The underscore Great GFS. I'm Sybil Amuti and I'm out. Peace. Yay Networks.